Hello and welcome back to another Coffee and Heroes podcast as we jump back on the uh, jump back on the horse of creator interviews. We've got a book we're really looking forward to coming out this year and we've been lucky enough to nail down the artist of that book and co-creator for uh, a little chat today. So your host is always Alan from Coffee and Heroes in Belfast. I'm joined by Keith as always, who will be uh, joining in the questions. But but our guest today is the artist and co-creator, as I say, of one of the most anticipated image titles due out in 2023. Uh, he's a native of St. John's, Newfoundland in Canada. His work was first published in 2004, and he's gone on to work on award-winning titles for publishers such as Black Mask, Vault Comics, and IDW. He is also a co-founder of the Breakdown Comics Jam, which has run for over 10 years and is a weekly initiative aimed at bringing creators together into a shared space and breaking down the myth that creative pursuits have to be solitary ones. But our focus today is going to be on that original graphic novel that's equal parts comedy, tragedy, and crime. And it's a title I'm sure is going to blow people away when it's unleashed on April the 19th. So that original graphic novel is Stringer. And our guest today is artist Paul Tucker. How are you, sir? I'm very well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I do like massaging a little bit of an ego at the start. You know, it's always nice for you know, Listen, the, the comic art is needed because we just spend so much time in our head, like trashing ourselves. So I'll, I'll take it where I can get it. Well, that's exactly it. Just as I was saying, uh, just before we came on here, you were saying about how you like to participate and, and watch these kind of things because it can be a lonely pursuit. So I love the idea that you do actually um, have that breakdown comics, Sam, but I've got to be question a little bit further down in that. So. Um, but yeah, given that this is, of course, a comics podcast, we've all we always have to kick things off with the big question, of course, and we may already know the answer. But for our listeners, DC or Marvel, or have you always had a preference for indie comics? Yeah, um, I've always had a preference for for indie comics because I guess Image arrived on the scene when I was like the perfect age to be blown away by it, and uh, see, I was like ten or eleven, I guess, and. Um, I had I had gotten some Marvel comics prior to that, uh, just off the spinner rack, and I was like, my interest was there. Like I was like, okay, right, this is kind of fun. Like I, we would go to my uh, grandmother's house, which is in a pretty rural area, so it was not a lot to do there, and that was probably for the best. So they did have a really <laughs> good, they did have a really good spinner rack at the convenience store, and uh, my dad bought me uh, a comic, and like I said. Yeah, I was kind of like, this is kind of cool. But by the time we came back again, like a few months later for Easter or whatever, uh, in that, like in those intervening months, image had happened. So suddenly on the spinner rack, there were these comics that looked different because they were colored differently primarily. And when I picked up, it was Savage Dragon was, was the one that got me. And I picked up issue three and I took it home with me and I flipped through. And, I, and when I read the whole thing and I got to the last page, like I've kind of mythologized that moment as, you know, at me staring into the middle distance and saying, okay, well, this is what I have to do. <laughs> and part of it was knowing that this book was written and drawn and inked all by the one guy. And it was his character. And when he killed people off, they stayed dead. And there was just so much life in, in this book for me. And it felt like, okay, this is, this is, these are comics for, for, for my generation. And, you know, those, those old dusty ones are for the old heads. So, uh, yeah, uh, I never really looked back from that. I've, I've always been attracted to those works that feel like, they could have only been made by the people making them, which I largely find in indie comics. Not to say there aren't like you know obviously great books made made in the in in, in other fashions, but I'm an indie guy, yeah. Yeah, and and were you uh, like a big consumer growing up with regard to sort of the the the, the range and a number of titles you were reading? Was it a like was it, would you have considered yourself a a comic guy? You know, whenever you were a kid. Yes, yeah, definitely as a kid, like I would be going in every week. And like, I remember very specifically a time there was like a really big cliffhanger in Savage Dragon and my dad was taking me down to the comic book store downtown and like, he couldn't find a parking spot. And I was like, <laughs> losing my mind. I was like, just let me out. And like, he let me out in the middle of the road and I ran down the street <laughs> and I ran the, into the, into the shop and I read the comic standing up in the store like which was a bit of a no-no but like i think the the guy knew me and he knew i was buying it but yeah like, yeah so i became pretty regular and would you know i'd buy up loads of 
image titles at that time primarily yeah i mean I, that 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 was kind of a golden age i guess wildcats and uh you know yeah. all of, you know obviously spawn um you know there's some great some great uh some great books at that time savage dragon was your was your your big one but uh you were you were on a bunch of the others as well yeah i mean yeah oh yeah absolutely um yeah dragon's the one i would return to and it's amazing and inspiring that it's still going and you know i've i've dipped my toe back in from time to time it's like you know it's there it's so like warm and comforting that it's still being made uh yeah, I mean, there's definitely other titles that were like yeah. inspiring, and when you when I flip through those old comics, like I can still see some of the DNA. And sometimes when I'm drawing certain things now, um, especially if I go away from it and come back to it, I'll glance at a panel and I'll see the lines of like some some specific, or maybe it's Sam Keith or something. I'll be like, holy, like. I didn't realize I was doing that there. Like that's in there. But yeah, it's, you know, it becomes part of the mix, which is really fun. Part of your style. That's, uh, that's yeah. really interesting. And it's it's funny, it's funny what sticks with you. I mean, I remember one of my one of my favorite books of that era was Wetworks, which was Wells oh, Potasio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just I really enjoyed the the story. But that was the first time I'd seen his art and as you say, the the, the vibrancy of those colors. And even now, whenever you see, whenever I see a Wells Portasio book, I'm like, ah, there we go. That's, you know, it's, yeah. it's one of those signature sort of, those signature image styles, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a nostalgia for that early image uh, look these days, I find. <laughs> it's yeah. interesting because I've went back and read some of the early image stuff. I'm a, I'm a big image guy. Um But I go back and read some of that early stuff and it is not very well written, but I think it is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, that's the bag that they always get, right? That that the writing was pretty poor, but it it you know it scratched the itch for a lot of ten and twelve year olds <laughs> for sure, right? And, oh, absolutely. They they knew inspired what they were a lot of people. There. Well, I suppose yeah. that's why, as you say, it's uh, you were inspired more to be an artist as a result of Image Comics rather than a writer. Would that be? Would that Perhaps. be? Perhaps. Yeah, I don't know. Like the whole artist writer thing is interesting to me. Like, yes. The jobs are delineated. Um, I've never really, I don't know, I've, I've spent much time of thinking about myself not as a writer, if that makes any sense. I, I like working with writers because I know, I'm, I'm not discounting like their efforts and what goes into making a good script. But like a lot of the projects I work on, I'm lucky that the writers are responsive to me contributing to the plot or, you know, telling a lot of story visually um, or even coming up with ideas for how the book should end. So I don't know. I, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of crossover with the practice of drawing and writing. A hundred percent. It's such a collaborative industry. You know, you can't have one without the other. And, and it's interesting because I we we spoke about this before in store and on the podcast. I mean, we we'll always say to follow creators you enjoy rather than characters. And nine times out of ten, you know, the the modern media would be like a new Tom Keen book or a new Chip Zdarsky book. They won't mention the artist, so to speak. But yeah. for me, I've always said it in store: good art will save bad writing. You'll maybe give something another go. Um, if the art's good, but um, if the art's terrible, but the story's amazing, if it's not visually pleasing to look at, you're not going to continue with it. So it, it is an interesting thing. It must be frustrating. As you said, it's maybe more you're more delineated in that sense where you're called more of an artist than a writer. But for me, the artist is more important than the writer. Surely. <laughs> Listen, I'll disparage, writer, I'll disparage writers all day long. Now. <laughs> I, you I used to do that. that <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I don't, I don't, I don't pick that fight in the comics world. Uh, I do, I, I've worked in advertising a lot over the years, and I used to always make fun of writers in advertising. But you know, if they can't, if they can't take me bullying them a bit, then they're, they're yeah. in bigger trouble. Well, this podcast's going to take a turn now, so I may need to just update the script with many attacking writers' questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'll not do that. I mean, you, you were saying there, you know, you like to work with uh, with guys who are obviously very responsive to your input. It's not just a stay in your own lanes kind of thing. And I mean, the theme of your work seems to be that you work with the same creators again and again. I mean, this certainly applies to Patrick Kinlan, who, of course, you worked on Stringer with and who we'll discuss a lot more later on. But also Paula Lore as well on Ted through IDW and Hollow Heart through Vault. 
I mean, how did that creative partnership come about with yourself and Paul? Was that um something you met at a con or he was he liked your work or you reached out? How did how did that creative partnership come along? Because that's um, there's some great work yeah. through there. I, I really enjoyed Hollow Heart. I must say that was a that was a recent one I enjoy, very much enjoyed. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very proud of that work. Yeah, it's it's interesting working with both guys because like they're very, very different writers and very different people. Um, you know, it's it's like dating I, i've heard that reference before about finding collaborators that you like to work with and it's hard like your sensibilities need to match up and uh i found that with both those guys and and i think they 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 definitely like scratch a different itch so i met paul i met paul at a convention i met him at new york comic-con but we had been like twi twitter friends and maybe like there were some like email exchanges about trying to connect on a thing. Cause we were like mutually admiring each other's work. Um, and, and that kind of continued for a while until we had this opportunity with, uh, with Ted and uh, we finally connected on a thing. And then it was honestly, it was kind of the same thing with hollow heart. It took a while again for us to, to land on a project that had a, that had a home and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll work together again. Like, I feel like with with Paul, I get like to tap into like some emotional storytelling. Like his, his writing is very full in that way uh, and really beautiful. And like, I like Patrick's like on the ground, deep dive, like nitty gritty exploration of certain subjects. And his just pretty like wild approach in his scripts at times. Like he's a writer who will like often put a little apology in for like what he's about to ask you to do. Cause he knows it's going to take a while. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah. 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 But Brilliant. both of them are really, uh, yeah, they're both very responsive to like my input and, and, and any sort of visual direction I want to take things. That's that, that collaborative element again we were we were talking about. Yeah. Um I mean you mentioned that you know, you probably work together with, with, with Paul again. Do you have anything definitive in the in the uh, pipeline you can tell us about? <laughs> no, there's no no big leads right now, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, you know, I I just have a feeling that we will we will uh we will connect again. Great, great. Well, that's fair. Yeah. I mean, obviously Hollow Heart, you know, it was hard horror sci fi. Uh, whereas Stringer is obviously much more of a down to earth, you know, realistic art style. Do you think those creative shifts are important to your visual style? You know, do you like that challenge, you know, moving from genre to genre? Because those two books are very, very different to say the least. I know. Yeah. I'm not sure how good it is for me to, uh, uh, for my brand, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I, I am interested in, in those shifts in, in like how one might approach one project versus another. And like the, the, the works that were that Patrick and I are, are, are doing now have a lot of potential for that. Like we're, we're hoping to do like a series of shorter things where part of my thinking was I'd like to be able to like jump around a bit with the look. Um, I find like I'm a little bit less like when I was a bit younger, I was a bit more like, oh, my God, I want to like desperate to try like the range <laughs> of like what things could, could be. But these days I feel like it's coming a bit more fully formed, a bit quicker, like how I want it to look. And I'm just trying to like refine and get it to the like it's like every artist has always said it like you you end up working your career to like end up trying to make less lines basically and that's kind of what i'm trying to do now is like learn the lessons from the last book so that i can like distill it into something a bit more pure for the next book um yeah i don't know it's kind of hard to put into words but i am thinking about that like literally this week as i was like just putting some touches on on a new thing and Oh, I was thinking very much about the the approach. Yeah, 
Cool, cool. Now, I mean, obviously, we want to get on to uh, to chat about uh, Stringer, and thank you very much for uh, for giving us a wee preview of that. Uh, yeah. We've uh, we've both had a chance to to get through it, but uh, just before we do, um, you mentioned uh, Breakdown Jam, which which you're a founder of. Now, we talked just beforehand. Uh, I I work with with musicians and uh, quite a bit, and very often, as we talked about, like sort of visual artists, that can be a real solitary pursuit. So Breakdown jams, as I understand it, is is about creating a shared space that folk can can come together. Could you tell us a wee bit about that? It sounds, I mean, it sounds like really a lot of work. Yeah, it's it's been really rewarding over the years. So that was founded between myself and Wallace Ryan, who is the letterer on Stringer and was the letterer on Nobody's in Control. So he, uh, I, I call him the Godfather of Newfoundland comics. <laughs> He's a He's 20 years older than me. So when I was uh, very uh, young, I took a course of his. Uh, he was teaching comics here through the university. And my my mom got my brother and I into this course, even though we were a bit under the age that, <laughs> that was uh, wow. posted for it. Um, so he's become a dear friend and collaborator. And uh, he's just a great character, <laughs> a, a, a very fun individual. And so he and I, um, he he had uh, established a jam here in, in town prior to the breakdown jam, and that kind of fizzled out a bit. And then he uh, he had been moved away to New York for a while. When he came back, we decided time to get the jam going again. I wanted to have a space where hopefully we could grow a bit, like the uh, the community of artists and writers here in St. John's or in Newfoundland. And uh, I think we've been kind of successful in that way so over the, like over the years we've had like many folks come through the doors and I've, I've watched young artists grow and 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 met folks who have gone on to be published and uh it's it's a, a great event you know COVID kind of kicked it it kicked its ass for a little while like it did many things but we're we're back to doing a, a monthly event again which I'm very, very happy about yeah yeah and it's just cool like it's always been all ages we do it on a Friday night just because we kind of want to attract the people who are like willing to go out on a Friday to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, the space is donated to us very kindly by uh, the Anna Templeton center. So uh, yeah, it's, it's always a good place to kind of recharge your batteries. And, you know, I often bring pages to Wallace that he's going to letter so we can like pour over them. And it's, that's been a real, uh, savior for me uh working on like longer books is to have someone real world his studio is yeah. is just down the street from mine so that's fantastic i mean that's yeah that that sort of thing uh, that you're describing and uh you know having because it can be a fairly solitary pursuit as you were saying i mean it can be can be great for the soul as well great for the mental health i guess oh yeah no, yeah, no, absolutely. That, that support and just on. having like the younger folks working alongside some older, older people and mm -hmm. just overhearing some of the conversations like, and uh, I've seen people kind of team up and coming to the jam with a stack of pages that they inked belonging to one of the other artists. I'm like, ah, brilliant. This, brilliant. this is good. This is the good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Well done uh, on, uh, thank you, thank on, on cool finding that. That's, that's really fantastic to hear. Um, So we'll, we'll get into, uh, we're going to need a bit of chat about uh, about what we're here for, uh, Stringer. Um, sure. And uh, as as uh, as I said, we I think we we both been through it. Uh, thanks very much for for sending that on. But uh, this is another collaboration with Patrick Kindlin, who you created uh, the aforementioned "Nobody Is in Control" with. Uh, but how did the how did the idea of Stringer come about, and uh, how long have you guys been been working on it? Uh, it's got quite a long history, like a lot of books do. <laughs> um, so as we were finishing Nobody's in Control, I had an idea. I The, the, the seed of the idea was mine because I'm a huge tennis fan. And I wanted to do something in that space. And I just thought that the like aesthetic, specifically of like 1980s tennis, like the outfits and the like, all, all the different like global aspects of the sport uh you know really would lend itself to some fun visuals 
So I think I sent Patrick a, a paragraph like with like just the very beginnings of an idea, you know, the, the core idea being about a racket stringer. I like I like the idea of a niche job that people don't think about that it doesn't like no one thinks about the stringer <laughs> but it it kind of arose as a fashionable thing in the 80s for the mega stars i think ivan lendl was maybe the first one to to have a personal stringer who would um accompany him on various tour stops and uh yeah they get you know they get tennis players are very like uh ritualistic and like they want everything to be a certain way so i was like oh this is just like too fun to think about like what a weirdly specific job so the idea of um this 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 stringer you know dealing a little bit of drugs and then ending up like having way too many drugs <laughs> <laughs> and then like tr uh you know touring touring the world and and the and the and the troubles that will you know inevitably follow him. I'd have to go back through my emails. That that was probably that might have been 2018 when I sent that email, which is a long time ago. Uh -huh. But uh, the the project actually got greenlit in 2019, and I started working on it. And then when COVID happened, I kind of stopped working on it because everything kind of got. The, the publishing slate was like all getting pushed out and I also had to do hollow heart and I was working a full-time job in advertising at the time. So I couldn't do it all. Um, so everything got shifted out. And then I basically picked up again with, uh, with Stringer in 2021 and worked on it for well, a year and a half, I guess, but <laughs> But the, the inevitable thing happened when I came back to it after being away from it for a year, I redrew everything I had done <laughs> in, in 20, at the end of 2019 in early 2020. It was just like, it wasn't all pulped, but it was mostly, yeah, mostly had to be redone. So uh, yeah, it goes back a while. It's always like a bit uh, harrowing to think about how long it, it, it takes. But in my mind, in my heart, it was more of like, from August 2021 till well a, a few months ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's I mean it's that's a real it's a real interesting premise. Uh as you say, the the that niche job, the idea of a of a racket stringer and the the whole the whole uh drug running side of it uh and the sure. the international angle. Now I'm not a I'm not a sports guy. I'm definitely not a tennis guy. Uh so you know initially I was like, oh hold on, but reading it now it's <laughs> it absolutely is is right there well the tennis is the tennis is the backdrop right it's, it is yeah it's a it's a vehicle for a you know a, a series of offbeat characters that we kind of that kind of come and go and i like that a lot in patrick's writing uh it happens it happens a bit in nobody's in control but there's the sense of the characters that we meet along the way all feel like they're the main character in their own book, but we only see them for a few pages and then then they're just gone. And I, I really like that. Like it appeals to me as far as my sensibility as a creator has never been like I've never been a like world building guy, which I don't know if it sounds bad, but I am character guy. And uh -huh. like there's a character in Stringer who's just um the bar the bartender who he only says okay yes yeah, the French the That's French bartender for say <laughs> yeah yeah and like I'm like I love this guy like my <laughs> mind goes spinning like I'm not a world building guy yet when I draw him I feel his life I'm like like there wow. is there's backstory for him I don't know what it is but it, <laughs> it, it exists right <laughs> so a lot of them like a lot of movies I like are like that like. I don't know if you ever saw the hit, like it's an old movie from the seventies, and uh, there's one called Betty Blue. These are movies that just like it's like kind of a road movie where you're yes. you're just meeting meeting these wild characters as you go, and yeah. I love it so much fun. To, fun but a but a bit of show not tell there, I guess. 
Yeah, I'm I'm all about that. Yeah. I'm yeah. all I'm all about that. <laughs> I really am. I I like I like people watching and just imagining, you know, their lives. Their their lives, yeah. Well, you yeah. say you're not word building, but you know, entire words within a within someone else's mind, you know. Uh Yeah, I guess it's like I'm a, I'm an abstract world builder. Yeah. Like I, I, it's all smeary and colorful and I get a feeling and an energy, but like I don't know what this character's parents name are like i don't know what tim's ex-wife's name is like i don't know <laughs> fair enough fair enough that's really interesting well i mean you had mentioned that it's set in the 1980s you know a lot to do with the aesthetic and you know what tennis was like at that time and so forth i mean first of all kudos for set that specifically in 1983 a great year year i was born uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what i was wondering with it is that this might be my old man cynical question but i think is there a longing to tell stories in a simpler time, do you think, you know, before the modern internet, social media driven sort of image obsessed time we live in now? You know, there's, there's so many storytelling crutches you can rely on now, I think, through technology. And it's so great to see stories set in what I think is a simpler time. Do you think that's something that creeps into the work at all or am I just totally overanalyzing things here? Um, I don't know. There might be some of that in there. I don't. I don't know if I... Like could could a cookie and mule really exist behind the scenes in the modern world where everybody has their camera phones and everything's being recorded and everything's in, like our lives are in HD now, whereas in the past it was maybe easier to hide in the in the background, as you say, for yeah. a quote non-important job or a lesser thought of job. Yeah, it's definitely there's something more fun about that. Like for especially for like a crime story of this nature, like it's kind of like, hee hee, look what I'm getting away with back here and no one cares because yeah. everybody's drunk or high on cocaine or whatever. Um, I don't know how, like, I don't know if I have that, like, uh, simpler time vibe for me in my approach of it. Like, I don't know if, I always feel like, you know, that that happens to every generation. So in like 25 years, the kids now, now we're going to say the same thing about 2022 or whatever. Mm. Um it was interesting, like working on some of this during like COVID times, especially like there's these very crowded court scenes. And I was drawing that at a time when we were under a lockdown. And, uh, and I think I had, I had this thought of, I didn't think this was going to be the science fiction fiction book I was <laughs> working on today. <laughs> Because I was also working on Hollow Heart, and I thought, okay, that's the science, that's the sci-fi book. And then I, I switched over and I was drawing this crowd of people, and I was like, wow, I really. When the script came in for this, I did not know that this would turn into the sci-fi part of it. So, at that point, yes, I was yearning for a simpler time. <laughs> you were nostalgic for a room with more than three people in it. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, fast forward, I actually went to the U.S. Open last year. It was the first time I went and, went and saw professional tennis, and uh, it was very much packed, and uh, we, were, we were back, baby. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, with regards to Stringer, I mean, was, was Image Comics always going to be the home for Stringer? Was it shopped around different labels, different publishers, sorry, or was it always Image was the aim? Um, we were lucky enough that, like, right when we were developing it, uh, Patrick was invited to like pitch to the two image. So we were both very, very excited about that. And uh, yeah, so they said yes. And it was, it was always the home. Brought everything so, full circle from that, you know, young boy going in and picking up Savage Dragon. It definitely, yeah. Uh, you you can't help but find the poetry there for sure. <laughs> that's uh, that's great that the, the stars sort of aligned, uh, you know, in order to to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, you work on like so many pitches and so many things that don't go anywhere and when when you get a win like that you really you really got to celebrate. And was was Stringer always designed to be to be a, an original graphic novel or was there ever a more traditional sort of single issue release really schedule discussed? No, it was always always going to be a graphic novel. We pitched it as a hardback. Um, I was actually really inspired by, um, like the, the slimmer hardbacks, like the, my heroes have always been junkies format. Um, so I actually was thinking more novella, but, uh, 
by the time Patrick was through with it, it was not a novella anymore. Um, so yeah, we work in a way where he's kind of basically feeding me a chapter at a time and I don't really know what's going to happen, which is pretty fun. Actually. I kind of, I kind of like not knowing, uh, but I, I was kind of like, I was kind of wondering when it was going to be done. <laughs> <laughs> this because, chapter keeps flowing after chapter. Yeah. The classic, he's not here to defend himself, but the classic email from Patrick would be like, Oh yeah, here's a, here's part five. Um, I think, uh, I think we can round this out with a really tight part six. <laughs> um, I'm like, all right. And then he'll send me part six. And with it, it's like, just, uh, it'd be a half chapter for part seven. And then he sent me that with an epilogue and I'm like, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm loving drawing this book, so I can't really complain. It's just, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, uh, I'm a planner or I'm a calendar guy. So I, I kind of uh -huh. like to know where I'm going to be <laughs> uh <-huh>. in a project. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you'll be, uh, be glad to hear that uh, in reading it you don't kind of think when is this going to end uh, <laughs> <Because> <laughs> so, so, that, so that doesn't uh, that doesn't cross over oh, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't in that way like I was it was more just like you know budgeting my time and how of course. is this project going to be done of yeah, I mean you're you're very much speaking our language there when you mentioned my heroes have always been junkies you know we're uh -huh. huge huge Brew Baker Phillips fans um, the stuff they're doing with Reckless right now is is arguably the best work of their career. And I was wondering if maybe the fact that this got greenlit through Image was, do you think a lot of that has to do with the success of Brew Baker and Phillips showing that you don't necessarily have to follow the traditional single issues, then graphic novel collection release format? Do you, do you think they've paved the way for sort of a new form of storytelling comics a little bit? I really hope so. Like, yeah, I love those guys too. And I want to see more of these types of books. So that's why I made one. <laughs> um, I really hope that it, it, it's instilling faith in, in comic book stores that you can move these books. And like I've, and just in casual conversation with people, like uh, there's a, there's an audience for it, right? There's, there's people who want to pick up like a nice, nicely designed hardback book that, you know, let's be realistic like you can read a reckless book in in a sitting or two and like you can read our book in a, in a, in a sitting like I, i'm hoping you'll want to like pour over it and go back over it because we gave you enough kind of visual fun uh but yeah i, th I think they had to have like, like opened some doors I, I can't really say i i my dialogue with with image has been somewhat minimal throughout the process like uh, Patrick has the the closer relationship with those folks, but uh, I hope so. I'm hoping that we're not the only ones that are like, I it, it's, I I say all this and I'm like, I'm having that moment where I'm like, this is like, I'm being incredibly bold <laughs> and being like, yeah, we're just, yeah, we're just the next ones. We're just, yeah, yeah. Like it's Brewbreaker and Phillips. Like they've like been in the trenches forever, like making hits, like, crazy for decades so uh let me just apply a, a humble lens over all this and be like that's all right man it's your interview we're interviewing you we we hope <laughs> that we can uh, follow in that vein and we're definitely uh inspired by that format and hope others are as well uh, i take it uh, i take it you've read uh, the reckless stuff yes i'm 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 a book or two behind because of i i I kind of limit my my comic reading these days is like every day after dinner with a cup of tea, uh -huh. and my my partner got me the Akira box set, and I I finally just finished it, <laughs> and uh, so now I'm, I'm I'm finally moving on to some other some other books. So I'm a bit behind, but yes, yeah. Well, you get uh, you get some great stuff to look forward to. Uh, I am yeah, jealous of wait. you. Yeah, can't wait. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I guess. We, we've talked a wee bit, you, you mentioned a wee bit the, the collaborative process there with, with with Patrick, and we've talked a wee bit about, about collaboration and, you know, yourself as, as an artist and a, 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 a thinking as a writer, you know, but I mean, with this particular thing, uh, is it sort of more staying in your own lanes or is it a, a, a much more joint creative process? It certainly sounds a wee bit like the latter with, with regard to what you've referred to. Um. 
Yeah, we we stay in our own lanes a lot. I, I think, um, like typically, I'll, I'll, I'll well with this project, I sent Patrick the the seed of the idea, and then he sent me like the fir whole first chapter of written. Uh, I don't think there was much before that. There might have been a little bit more of a an expanded treatment that we showed image. Yeah, there definitely was. But then it's just getting a chapter at a time. And I usually don't have a lot to say, but with with the thumbnailing process is where a lot like I'll inject a lot of visual ideas. And every now and then it might be like something a bit more or a bit more substantial. Like I know with Stringer, like I requested it like a little bit, a little bit of a script change towards the end. And yeah, but we mostly, do, we mostly do stay in our own lanes. I think like, I really, I really love get you know, getting script from in my inbox is always exciting. So, and then I, uh, I go back with the thumbnails and there's usually, usually just says cool and, and off we go. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I suppose part of that is having the trust with, you know, working with the same person, you know, they're sort of writing for your visual style. But I guess one of the reasons we ask about it being sort of a joint creative process, you know, Stringer's a gorgeous, visually inventive book. I mean, some of the panel layout work, I think, is phenomenal, you know, whether it's, you know, working a roulette table into a visual joke or it's laying out points in a tennis game, of course, putting through your love of tennis, you know, through the ball's trajectory or even just your double splash pages establishing where you are. I mean, are all of those your idea or do you and Patrick sort of talk through visual motifs? Um, a take, lot credit of for it, it. take credit for it if it's all your yeah. idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. A lot of that visual stuff is me. Um, like the roulette table was me. Uh, I know that. I'm pretty sure. But like Patrick does make some pretty request interesting requests or like even just directional like like he he'll prescribe panels but sometimes it'll just be like uh the characters are going through a maze um it should be kind of disorientating like i don't know come up with something <laughs> <laughs> so I, I that that works perfectly for me like i i love the thumbnailing stage and i don't know I don't know where the that major inspiration comes from. I, I feel like I must have read something somewhere at some point that really clicked with me for like doing fun stuff with layouts. Um, but I really, I really do enjoy that part. But there's, I, I, I don't want to discount like Patrick asks for some weird stuff sometimes, and uh, you guys were, had a slight disservice. Like this book is going to be a little clumsy to look at on a screen because it's such a spread oriented book and at one point you even have to like turn the book upside down absolutely you do. <laughs> i feel like I, I don't know should i like mention that in this email like that they'll figure it out yeah <laughs> but like i remember that email he had that part of the script he had he had described the action as being like two separate scenes and he's like small box small like box big box you know, small box, small box, big box. And when I sketched it on my, in, in my, in my sketchbook, I was like, this is almost a tennis court layout. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Right. If I just switch the, if I just put both the big boxes in the same, you know, opposite each other. Uh, and then I was like, well, the bottom scene is kind of like this grungy, like violent bit of action. Like what if, what if the reader has to volley the book, like a, like a tennis <laughs> I'm like, am I just being like a pretentious asshole? But, uh, <laughs> Not at all. That's, when, I, uh... when, I, when I when I ask that question, I'm like, yeah, well, maybe, but just you got to do it. <laughs> yeah. So Brilliant. it's a lot of his script that does inspire these like like wilder choices for sure. And there's been stuff that he's like, he's requested that like I tapped out on. He had re he had requested a spread where. Um, a bunch, a bunch of smaller panels form uh, the negative shapes within them form the silhouettes of the two characters doing the kickboxing. Ah, right. And I thumbnailed and thumbnailed and like, I think I even fully drew it. And 
it just, I could not make it work. I was like, I don't like to tap out. I'm like, oh, that one was too hard. Like, there's only so much time you can commit to an idea. And that one I had to like admit defeat to. Uh, I think I mean, what we did instead was still cool. Definitely. I mean, and, and I mean, there's, there's, there's even creative, creative ways, you know, that the balloon placement has gone. There's one, one spread in there where it's just a, it's an ever decreasing, it's, it's almost like spiraling down a drain as he's spiraling. Uh, yes. You know, yeah, the, the zoetrope spread. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. 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 Well, that's that's the joy of working of having Wallace like a ten minute walk from my my studio is is so like there's pages I bring to him where I'm like I'm leaning on you for this one because when your layouts are wild, as long as we feel like the your eyes following through the lettering, like I think we'll we'll be clear, right? So I I, I, come, I go over, I usually have it kind of like dummied in where I, the lettering is already kind of roughed in there. And I'm s slowly kind of anticipating some of Wallace's choices. Um, but it's really fun to like work closely with him and make sure that it's going to be, and I try to give the comic to someone afterwards and be like, can you read this? Does this make sense? <laughs> yeah. I wonder, I wonder, do you have to be a little more established as a comic reader to uh, to follow some of those I don't know. I, I I try to give it to some people outside comics sometimes. And I I think I I think that most of this book was like pretty it was pretty readable, I think. Oh, I, I like to think so. Yeah. I mean I'm I'm looking forward I'm looking forward to to to, to seeing the physical the physical thing. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, and uh you know, as opposed to to sort of reading it on the screen, as you say. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So I mean you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, earlier on uh, just uh, just a moment ago, you mentioned Akira, and uh, and uh, I mean speaking visually. I understand that you you spent a year in Japan teaching English. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, is it fair it to is, say yeah. that 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 sort of more high paced kinetic style of of manga has has had an influence on your on your style? I think it's in there. Yeah, I think if I go back and look at some of the work I was making closer to that time, that or the, or the work I was making when I was there. It's it's a bit more evident. I was like doing a bit more with like like diagonal panels and and motion lines, and I did buy a lot of like screen tone that I still have from there, and amazingly uh, some brush pens because like I I left Japan in two thousand seven, and I used a brush pen I bought there two days ago, and I I, I, I pressed in on it and the ink came came out the well. And I'm like this thing still works. <laughs> I was just amazed by it. So, uh, yeah, just like the, I still have some art supplies from my time there. Uh, yeah, I'd say like if if Akira is gonna like, I don't know, if, I, I don't I don't want to even think about Akira trying to influence me. <laughs> it's like that's the kind of book I can read just purely because no part of me thinks. I can do this or ever want to even try to do this. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> It's just, you know, it's like Barry Windsor Smith and Monsters last year. It's like, all right, like I I can like it's it's the books that I pick up that are a bit more in my scope of what I like I'm trying to do, where I, I sometimes get distracted or like Yes. Get yeah, like I can't really fully detach myself. So yeah, I don't know. I would like to I, I'd like to I like to bring it all on board. Like I I'm a big uh movie guy. So I, I watch a lot of like, you know, subtitled <laughs> indulgent criterion collection movies, like nothing wrong with that. But uh, I know, yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, you're no fun at parties if you, if you try to talk about it. <laughs> but like a long t I, I shifted to like a really early rise, like um for my my drawing schedule like 10 years ago or longer, just because when I was working in advertising i was so exhausted at the end of the day that i had nothing left in it in, in me so i shifted to like a 5 a.m rise but as a result now on the weekends i tend to wake up like pretty early by normal people's standards and my other problem was i always fell asleep during movies so i i put the two two together and i was like i'm gonna wake up on saturday morning and i'm gonna watch my my subtitled movie in bed and it's gonna be great so I've been doing that for the last few years. And it just like, 
I like filling up the tank with just even movies I don't like, like there might be something in it or some sort of visual or I like, I like adding as much to the mix as I can to like, hopefully like, that's what I find interesting about art, like music and visual art is you find something you love and then you, you I like to study the, its parts, its components. Yeah. And then hopefully you find other stuff that you, that's, that's really fun and cool and you can keep going backwards. Yeah. I mean, speaking of criterion and, you know, not being fun of parties because of your love of subtitled movies and stuff. One of my favorites actually just came out there in a, a trilogy box set, uh, the uh, Infernal Affairs trilogy, uh, which was the, the basis for Martin Scorsese's The Departed. But you try to tell right, right, that yeah, yeah. Infernal Affairs is a better movie than The Departed. They just look at you and roll your eyes and go, I'm not watching some <laughs> subtitled movie when I could watch Marty Scorsese. Uh, <laughs> phenomenal movie. I haven't, yeah, seen, I, I haven't seen those ones. I, I don't oh, know. Do, are, do are they on the channel? Good. Do you know? Uh, possibly it's just been released as a, a trilogy box set. There's three of them, but The right. Departed is about 150 minutes long. The first Infernal yeah. Affairs movie is about 95 minutes. It is so Ooh, like tightly it. packed. It is there's not an ounce of fat on it. It is a phenomenal piece of work. Um, and as I say, I think it's just that little bit better than The Departed. Although The Departed's a great movie as well. But yeah, yeah, Criterion's an interesting thing though. Do you, do you know what the first ever Criterion movie I bought was? And you would not expect it to be on Criterion. Like Armageddon or whatever. Armageddon, Armageddon? was yeah. on Criterion. <laughs> Although I, I stand by Armageddon, it's a lot of fun. And it has the best commentary you'll ever listen to as Ben Affleck systematically um, cuts through the stupidity of that movie. It's really, really entertaining. <laughs> but uh, I awesome. could speak about movies all day long. But yeah, getting back uh, specifically to Stringer, I mean, is this to be the first in a series of books? I mean, what can you tell us about Rabbit Hole? If any. Um, rabbit hole is is uh is is kind of in its early days i guess it, i i don't i don't know if i can really talk too much about it because nothing has been like set in stone but we are working on um we're working on projects that very loosely can be linked we we kind of make the stephen king comparison in that there, there could be like very loose crossover characters mm -hmm. um I mentioned earlier we're like working on some uh some shorter works uh but i think what you can expect from us is everything we do will be self-contained so even if it is more like a single issue project they'll all be standalone stories and i think patrick and i are both like excited to continue doing graphic novels and we have the beginnings of a new one which does connect to stringer but um is basically a different genre uh it, it, it won't feel it won't feel it'll feel like yeah this is the same world but um the thing we're developing is more of like a prisoner island sort of story Cool, cool. Um, that's that's very early days. Um, uh, yeah, I wish I had a more concrete thing to tell you, but that's that's kind of my uh, hope. Like, I, I maybe off air, I'd like to talk to you, you as a retailer, Alan, about like why we're approaching it this way. Like, I keep looking a lot into publishing models these days and how single issues are beneficial for creators because there's cash flow and for stores because of cash flow <laughs> but like you know longer runs are kind of questionable these days yeah, yeah. uh unless unless you got a big hit um so i'm i'm really interested in doing both so like i don't know if that's having my cake and eating it too but that's what we're trying to trying to do i think <laughs> remain remains to be seen you know yeah. in comics it's always hard to hard to say what your future is but uh i like the idea of getting in and getting out on some shorter things that would serve to like hopefully help build our audience and maybe push people into the into the the, the larger purchases mm -hmm. of the hardbacks well we less less said easier mended and i guess uh, we'll look forward to uh to talking to you again about those things whenever they're a little closer to fruition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm 
I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a store, I mean, I, I can only give my point of view on it, but I mean, you look at those reckless books for just as an example, and obviously those are guys at the absolute top of their, their their game, and as you say, decades worth of works. But you know, we have people stick those in their pull lists just as quickly as they'll put, you know, a new single issue series on their pull list. But yeah, it is definitely interesting because you know, if you go back 10, 15 years, you know, you had your long runs like your Walking Dead, your Invincible, your um Why the Last Man, your Hundred Bullets, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas these days, I mean it's saga. It's Spawn and it's Savage Dragon. And I don't think many other series, certainly independent-wise, maybe go above 20 issues. So it, it, it it's hard to get people on. To, I mean, Keith's a good example of this, just for a, a bit of a random example. But Keith very kindly looked after our store a couple of times when me and my other half, Vicky, were over in England. And we gifted him the Saga hardcovers to say thanks for looking after the after the store. But then Saga comes back after a three-year um a three-year absence and Keith was basically of the opinion that oh, I don't want these in single issues I have those nice hardcovers so it's hard to get people on to single issues that far down a run unless they've been on it from the beginning so it is yeah. a really weird model in a way you can you can jump in and out I think of DC and Marvel new story arcs new creative teams you know whatever you can jump on the Batman 125 if Chip Zdarsky's taking over but I think an independent story whether it's through Image or Boom or whatever when they advertise jumping on points, I think they're slightly, it's not really true. You kind of need the whole thing because it's the same writer the whole way through. It's the same artist. So it's it's interesting. I know the creators are obviously looking at different models because it's it's obviously a very long standing model. Single issues, as you say, cash flow combined for the graphic. Graphic takes uh, up the time in between story arcs, et cetera. But yeah, it's, it's always interesting your creator's point of view on it as well as to what the best way and what the best way of telling your story is as well, I suppose. You're you're kind of you know you 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 couple that you know the the story idea. If it was just the story idea, it would be it would be fine. You could switch between trades and 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 singles. But whenever you also factor in the fact that so many people who read comics are completionists, or you know have a wee bit of a wee bit of OCD going going on with regard to their collections. <laughs> Same edition, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, just a, a final look just on Stringer. It was nice to see that a character, uh, Donovan, was former SAS and stationed of all places in Belfast. That gave me a little chuckle. Right. <laughs> yeah, we did that for you guys. We saw, we saw yeah, I knew. I knew. <laughs> I knew. Keith, we've made it again. I mean, uh, absolutely. We, <laughs> not, we have made it into a comic really funnily. We, uh, a few years back, we had Clay Mann over in the store uh, for a signing. And uh, he was just getting ready to start Batman Catwoman at the time. And I joked at the signing, oh, you should put us in the book. He's like, yeah, I'll see what I can do. And then he never heard anything. He just thought he was being nice on the day. But if you actually look at Batman Catwoman issue 10, there's a fight between the Joker and Catwoman. And as they crash through a glass, they come out to the street. And there's our store logo just above the shop that they came out of. So that was uh, nice. That was pretty awesome. cool. But we weren't around in 1983. You know, I was barely alive. So it's okay to leave us out of this book. But we did have <laughs> advertising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Subsequent volumes might be set uh, more in the in the future. So uh, we, yeah. we always need uh, we always need extras in the background of our comics. Okay. Well, we, some of we, those uh, some of those court scenes. <laughs> I don't know where you. And then, yeah, absolutely. Some, there was, I mean, there was some great uh, some great visuals as Alan said earlier on. But one of my 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 favorites was the you know the court scene uh and then the 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 the, the hellscape psych psychedelic yeah court scene <laughs> yeah. and then the uh you know the court scene the you know below again with with, with everything else removed and just the characters that are yeah. i guess significant at that moment you know it was that was a really that was a really and that was movie. that was an example of where that was all as scripted now the details of what was going on in the hellscape like that was that was left to me but and that was also a like with apologies from Patrick, kind of like <laughs> this is gonna be a this can be a pain to draw. <laughs> ah, good stuff, good stuff. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, we do not want to keep you too much longer. You've been very, very good with your time. So uh we'll just uh, we'll swing back to a few more uh, a few more general questions, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. And uh I guess, I mean, because we're all we're all fans, we're all uh, you know, comic book nerds and you know. Do you still get a chance to to read and enjoy comics, or are you you too busy working on them to do that? Yeah, well, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I I felt like I had fallen into that, like 
too busy making them to read them kind of rut, which mm -hmm. a lot of, I've heard from a lot of artists, but I was like, hell no, man. Like I got to get back into this. Like I love it. So I made that conscious effort that, you know, after, after we, after we have supper and before, before the chores, like I'm sitting down with my cup of tea under the reading lamp. So that's been really, that's been really beneficial for me just to like get inspiration and, you know, keep up with the trades, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I finally read Berlin by Jason Lutz, um, which absolutely blew me away. He, we were lucky enough here in St. John's that uh, through the university, he was brought here to as part of a, an exhibit that I was part of. So I got to know him a little bit. And then I, but I hadn't read his, his major work. Mm -hmm. and, and I did after the fact and it, it made me cry. <laughs> so I wrote him, I was like, you know, thanks for the inspiration. So, wow. Uh, wow. yeah, I, I'm, I, I keep a good reading habit, a, a better reading habit these days. And I, I have lots of stuff here at the studio that I kind of like, will just pick out more casually when I, when I need a little break. Very nice. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, it is, it can be, you know, troughs and waves, you know, there's times that, you know, I've fallen off and, uh, and, and got back on the horse as it were, and I can still see those, those holes in my collection where I, where I fell <laughs> off. Um, do you, do you get a chance to be a, a like a Wednesday warrior, a, a new comic book day in your local comic store at any time or? Uh, no, no, I, I don't really have that kind of habit at all. Like, um, I'll, I'll reserve, I'll put in like a pull box for like some books, sometimes from like folks I know in the industry. So I want to like support them and get those. Like I, I do, it is still fun to get monthly comics. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I like that experience. I like the format. So I, yeah, I, uh, I'm a very very medium wednesday comics well it's it's thursday in newfoundland <laughs> it takes an extra it takes an extra day to get here <laughs> yeah i mean you've well, i don't know what day it is anymore between all the different distributors it seems like it's every other day yeah that, that, i mean <laughs> in, in our store we just sell on wednesday that's the way we look at i mean we get our deliveries on a monday so technically we could you know do and i believe in the states the dc model now is tuesday Marvel are sticking to Wednesday, but I, I just like new comic book day. So I just always go with the Wednesday, but yes, uh, it's just so much better for branding. Just have one day. It's yeah. just, you know, don't get me wrong. I'd love it if people come into our store on multiple days, Tuesday and Wednesday, but you know, they, they have lives. I'd rather just give them one day. That's when it's, uh, that's when it's out there. Yeah. You know? But, but obviously you'd mentioned sort of reading, you know, some classics and stuff like that. Do, do you keep up to date with any of the modern stuff or is it a case of the, the, the joy of comics in a way is that the, the library of greats out there is never ending or seemingly never ending. I mean, until the last year or two, I'd never read Bone. I'd never read Mouse. Sure. I've not caught up in those classics, but there's always stuff that, as Keith says, there's always gaps. But, you know, do, do you follow any current stuff? You know, I'd say the Brew Baker Phillips stuff. Is there any creators out there whose work you are enjoying at the moment? Um. Yeah, I mainly just kind of like keep an eye on what's bubbling up to the top and Christmas time, I'll stock up on things and catch up. So, like, I read Monsters last year, and um, I read Ducks this year. Uh, but yeah, no, there isn't there isn't a lot of like monthlies that I'm like following closely right now. I re I've been reading The Silver Coin because uh, Michael Michael Walsh is a uh, is a friend and has a home here in Newfoundland. So I see him from time to time mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I really like what he's doing there with that format. So shout out to him. Great book. Fantastic. Uh, another Walsh. Yeah. I read Suzanne, which is another uh, tennis themed gra graphic novel that came out from Avery Hill last year from Tom Humperstone. And if anyone, if you haven't checked that out, uh, it'd be a fun book to pair with our book. It's very different because it's, a period piece in the 1920s, uh, the Jazz Age, and going back to an even simpler time, if you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's beautifully executed, and I uh, really enjoyed that as well. I really like Silver Coin for the reason that nine times out of ten, it's it's a guest. Um, if you have a creator own book like that, it's it's the same writer, 
but a different artist each time for an anthology book. But that's the opposite. It's the same artist each time, but a guest writer. I I, I really love the visual style and the idea. And some of the names he's attracted to that book have been phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Ian, it's Ramsey, crazy. You know, Chip Zdarsky. It's, I, I love Silver Coin. And it's great as well because it's a good example of, you know, it's one of those rare things about what I was talking about before. It's hard to jump on a book if it's indie later on, but with Silver Coin, each book's like a one yeah. shot. You could kind of yeah. jump on it. I love it. it. Ice Cream Man is good for that as well. Yeah. yeah. And I, I picked up, that was one where I did pick up some trades and I picked up some single issues because I had heard from enough people because they're, they're doing some of the like more interesting, like fun, formal stuff that I'm attracted to. So uh, yeah, I, I like, I like what they're doing a lot as well. And I mean, in that, in that vein, uh, you know, the, 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 the Michael Walsh, you know, the, the, the artist sort of, driving things are there any are there any uh, creators out there at the moment that you would uh, you would value collaborating with anybody on your on your hit list as it were uh i don't know i have these thoughts sometimes when i read or like when i'm really psyched on like partnerships whether it is like brew baker and phillips or uh the the ice cream man team, which I'm like blanking on the artist's name right now. Marazzo, um, Martin Marazzo, isn't it? Correct. Yes. My key uh, credentials are safe. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get more like just excited to like work on the things that, that I'm doing with Patrick or, or with, yeah. with Paul. Right. Um, yeah. I sometimes feel like I should probably get, get my feelers out a bit better and, and be open to like working on working on something with somebody new because I, I know it I, I know it could trigger something interesting um yeah I, I it doesn't enter my my mind a lot I guess it, it does more in moments when like there might be a lull but the last couple of years I've been pretty steady drawing things mm -hmm. so I'd like to keep writing it while it feels like we're on something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Make, makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, we'll wind down just with the last couple of questions. I mean, I, I kind of think I know the answer to this uh, just based on, you know, how you get into comics and, and your preferences. I mean, is there any desire as an artist to work for either of the big two or do you prefer having the control over the characters you're working on by staying independent from their sort of pre-established worlds and characters? Yeah, yeah. Um... It might be like terrible for my career, but like, I don't think I've ever, it's never entered my mind to work for, to work for the big two. Um, not that they've ever come looking, <laughs> but, um, you know, might change my tune. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the right pro project might, might, uh, might appeal but again, because I was so inspired by like those image guys, I want to make things that I have ownership in. And so far I've been, that's all I've done. Like I've, I've only all the, the, the longer works are only creator owned. Um, I, I have a hard time even mustering up the, energy or the or i guess the enthusiasm to like do a sketch of of a of like a marvel or a dc or even like in another character that like an image character like i don't know what it is like i'm so excited to work on my comics that like if it's not the comic in front of me i kind of have like blinders on and like it becomes a bit of a, a task i'd almost rather do work in advertising because I at least know I'm, you know, that's going to pay a certain rate, and it's sort of different part of the brain detached. You know, I'll I'll never say never. Like, you know, if it was the Stringer team was was asked to pitch on a on like a Batman book, like every artist ever, I'd be like, well, you know, that's that that's cool, sure, let's let's do it. But it it's not something I spend any time thinking about. That's fair. That's that's actually a refreshing answer to hear because obviously so many, I, I mean, the industry has certainly changed in the last 10 to 15, well, probably changed since Image came along really 25 years ago. I know they had a little bit of a lull, but then Walking Dead came along. But I suppose it's it's interesting. A lot of guys, obviously, um, we, we would chat to that the end goal is always, 
you know, the, the big mm-hmm. carrot at the end of the stick is, you know, for the for the big two. But I think, yeah, the, the creator owned industry is probably stronger than it's ever been right now because it's not only that image are strong, but boom are very strong and dark horse are strong and you know, you've even got new companies coming through like AWA comics and stuff like that. So it's actually a refreshing answer to hear, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's been nearly mean, everyone has that Batman pitch in their head. <laughs> with the, with the quality, I mean, yeah. uh, do it. you know, the quality of what you're doing, I have no doubt that that eventually that that knock on the door will come. And uh, I hope you're, I hope you're always in the position that it's a it's a decision that you can make for yourself. Because uh, as Alan says, that's a, that's a cool answer. Yeah, it's tricky, right? Like you. We have a lot to balance. Like I've been lucky to be doing comics full time for the last well since I since I returned to 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 do Stringer uh, a year and a half ago. I I left my full time job, which is kind of like scary. Yeah, I know. I I don't feel that way all the time. Uh-huh. I, I, I still I still freelance like in the in the in the art direction world. Um, but you know. It, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a position to do this now. I don't know if I'll be in that position for, for a long time. So yeah, it'll always be a, you'll have to weigh things and how much income you can, uh, you can afford. <laughs> yeah. It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a familiar, it's a familiar story across, you know, I guess the world of, of creative arts, uh, you know, that idea of, of the, the, the dream success being, being able to, been able to to make a living wedge you know what i mean and uh, and and do it without without having to do too much more you know rather than you know so so well well done and, and well done you know being in a position to make that make that choice paul yeah i was even like even if even if it was only going to be this book you know like i i owed it to myself to to take the time and do it and everybody in my world is like yeah like <laughs> you've been getting up at five in the morning for 10 years like take a year <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will. Well, well, Phil, well, as as Keith has said already, you know, we've been very, very generous with your time, and it's been it's been great chatting with you. We could easily chat for another hour, at least, just about Criterion collections. I'm sure. But <laughs> um, I'll just finish off by asking. You know, it's always the question we like to ask, but uh, just asking if you do have a favorite DC title, a favorite Marvel title, and do you have a favorite indie title, just of all time? Now these. This, these answers are just for right now. You might wake up tomorrow and go, I really should have said that instead because there's maybe such sure. a large pool to choose from. But what, what comes to your mind right now for those those three? Um, the, the DC one's easy. It's Batman Year One for Mazzucchelli's artwork, which I can look at forever. And and it's usually like within an, within an arm's reach. Uh and I, yeah, I love everything about that book. I love both versions of the coloring. Um, I have like a weird Spanish like version that's like this big that I found when I was in Spain that had like the original coloring. So I was like, I have to buy this. Uh, so I think that's like just the peak of superhero comics. And I think a lot of artists would agree. Um, Marvel is a bit trickier, but I, I mean, the, the Matt Fraction, David Aja, I don't know. I think that's how you say his name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hawkeye Run. Obvious that was choice. when I actually did buy any in, in issues, uh, which is which was a rarity at the time. And uh, I think now that I think about it, I think there's some of that language of that book is in Stringer, as far as like ah. some of the more like inventive like design choices, and. I think like Aja's work is incredible. Like uh, Seeds is amazing, like huge inspiration. Uh, For the indies, I don't know if it counts, but uh, there's a volume of um, uh, Bernie Krigstein's work from EC Comics. I I, I don't know if you've called that the (laughs) Indies Aid. If that qualifies, it probably wouldn't at the time, but uh, I think... I think Fantagraphics published it. It's called Messages in a Bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it was, I think the last job Marie, Marie Severin did before she died was to recolor some of the these stories, and I straight up like totally stole her coloring style for Tet back when I did that book. Uh, absolutely, like Krigstein's artwork. Uh, 
it's just makes me sad that I don't think he ever did a story longer than 12 pages, but inside that volume, there's just such a variety of, of mark making and he approached comics from a fine arts lens. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think he only took up comics because he wanted the, uh, to put in the hours drawing. Like he thought, Oh, this is a great way to just get lots and lots of drawings in. And then he fell in love with the medium. Uh, so yeah, I can look at that book endlessly. Uh, Beautiful. And uh, yeah, I'll give a quick shout out for Asterios Polyp as well, but also by Mazzucchelli because that that book just is uh, it holds a special place in my heart and uh, really uh, as far as a graphic novel goes, it it really uses the form and uh, very beautifully constructed. I half expected you to say Daredevil Born Again for Marvel just for Mazzucchelli. Of course, yeah, go for a Mazzucchelli <laughs> trifecta. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I've like... actually read it all. I've been picking that. I've been trying to put that together in issues. I have bits and pieces of it now, uh, but I don't have I don't have it all. And I found the Mazzucchelli, uh Adventures of Indiana Jones comics that, that he drew recently. I was like, yes, <laughs> I like. I'm like, it's fun charting his artistic progression because it's it's a wild one. I think what you need is the large artisan edition of uh, Daredevil: Born Again. There's a oversized with the full size artwork and then scan familiar pages. Yeah. Wallace actually has a, a great he he calls it the library of graphic literature mm -hmm. which has its own YouTube show in his studio. So he has wall to wall hardcovers and he's got many of those beautiful artist editions. So it's a it's a great tradition at the start of a project usually I go I say Wallace I'm doing this book. Here are the here's the genre here here's some of the touchstones. And when I go over, he's got like books all like pulled for me to like, <laughs> oh yeah, I know, I know what you need to look at. So yeah, it's great. It's a great resource. I'm, I'm very, very lucky to avail of that. Very cool. I love that, that, uh, what you mentioned about David Adger and sort of potential influence on this, on this book. Uh, I don't know if you've ever picked up the, the stuff that he did with, uh, with Matt Fraction, uh, the Immortal Iron Fist stuff. Uh, yeah, it was it was fantastic. It's uh, it, it does, one of those. Yeah, does the same thing with uh, with martial arts as he does with you know the the, the creative archery stuff. You know, and as a yeah, uh, I thought that was that's really good stuff. If you haven't, well, obviously you haven't had a look at it. So brilliant. You know, awesome. you have a very very similar Marvel journey to me because I was never a Marvel comic guy. I've always been more DC, but uh, the early twenty ten stuff, whether it was fraction and Aja's hawkeye or it was g willow wilson's miss marvel or it was wade and samney's daredevil i was i was sucked into marvel comics through those slightly off-center titles rather than mm -hmm. avengers and spider-man just because i thought they were more visually interesting and maybe took more risks because they weren't quote top tier books uh but that wade samney run especially is just one of my my favorite runs of anything of all time so oh, yeah samney's samney's amazing yeah mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, big time. And a really nice guy as well. I have a large framed fire power poster in the store because uh, Diamond Comic Distributors didn't send me one. And I may have bitched about it a little bit on Twitter. <laughs> uh, about a week later, a package arrived in the post and it was from Chris Samley along with a wee drawn of a cup of coffee. Uh, just saying, I uh, hope you enjoy the poster. Uh, thanks. Oh, for wow. So awesome. I got that framed awesome. and up in the store. But but anyway, as I say, we could chat all day. But uh yeah, thank you very much for your time. It, is, it has been a, a pleasure chatting and uh, absolute best of luck with the book. As I say, the book is Stringer. It's due out on April 19th. Uh, we have ordered big on it. So, you know, get those pre-orders in to guarantee your copy. But uh, even if you don't get those pre-orders in, it'll take pride of place in the new releases section. So keep a little bit of spare cash in the back pocket for April 19th. You will not regret it. It is a fantastic book. And as Keith says, we're both looking forward to picking up our copies in, in hardcover because nothing substitutes for hardcover. <laughs> so just never match it no <laughs> say that as a fan not a business owner i promise but uh sure. yeah again it's it's been a pleasure chatting and uh best of luck with the book and we'll look forward to pushing it even more when it comes out thanks for having me